I really think it's rare, really rare, for the true American dream, what people consider the American dream, to occur today, where grandma and grandpa didn't give you any money. Because grandma and grandpa didn't have any money. Mom and dad didn't give you any money. You didn't fall ass backwards into something. But ultimately, you and you and Phil really built this on your back, just, just, you know, just bootstrapped it. You're listening to Barbell Logic, brought to you by Barbell Logic Online Coaching, where each week we take a systematic walk through strength training and the refining power of voluntary hardship. Hey, you're listening to the Barbell Logic Podcast. This is part of our new principles series. And uh, I'm going to introduce you all to a, somebody that you've heard about probably a few times before on the podcast, but never actually met. And that is my my little bro, my little brother, Chris. Uh, Chris is probably the person who is closest to me who has never been on the podcast. So welcome to the podcast, sir. Thank you very much. It's nice to be here. I wonder if, uh, I assume our voices are different enough that the listeners can distinguish between mine and yours. I would hope so. Although, if you remember correctly, when we were in high school, I remember that people literally did not know which one of us picked up the phone. So, right, right. Uh, it's this one will be probably easier for people because I've got the sweet mic, and uh, we haven't improved your your uh, setup yet there at the house. Um, and so, so I wanted to just have you on the show first. We're going to do some series. Some of these will be with me. Some of you with me, and some of the other members of Barbell Logic, and then um, I'd like to have you as a as a frequent guest on this Principles series, where we just talk about the things that are kind of important to us, principles in life. Um, you and I have a, most of our life principles are similar, although our worldview is different without getting into um, lots of details about what I believe and what you believe. We don't exactly land the same, certainly religiously or politically or things like that. You moved out of Springfield, Missouri, where we were basically raised a couple years ago now. Two, has it been two, two years ago? Yeah, two years. I, we just had a celebration to, of the two-year point about uh, a week ago. Yeah, you moved out of the Midwest into Boston, to the Boston suburbs. And uh, you, I'll go ahead and get to the end of the story, and then we'll back up and work away there, but um, you are recently retired, really. You you basically officially retired from your day-to-day job uh, in October of last year, of 19, is that right? Yeah, October 1st of 19 was my, my uh, first day of official retirement. And you are my younger brother, so you're 37. 37? I was 37 when I retired. Oh, yeah. That was the same month that I turned 38. Gotcha. So I'm jealous uh, that you're retired and living in Boston and you get to read all day. And so, uh, but I, I wanted to talk, so we've been, we've really been close most of our life. We have, we're, siblings tend to be this way. They're either like really close or like not really close at all. And we were uber competitive growing up for sure. And we weren't always like the best, bestest of friends, but we've been pretty close. And a lot of that is we were both boys. Our ages were pretty close. And then some of that was... We were just raised uber poor in the middle of nowhere with really kind of nobody else to play with. That's exactly right. That's why I had uh, two boys and a girl <laughs> in the exact order. You of, timed uh, that? You planned yeah, all that? I planned all that out. But uh, it was really nice. You know, when I think back to our childhood of having somebody to play with, with nobody else around, I mean, we always, yeah, you and I just went off and played whenever we could. Sometimes we beat the crap out of each other and for fun. Yeah. And sometimes we were out just, you know, playing baseball or basketball or football or whatever. Yeah. I think one of the things that I wanted to be able to, one of the reasons I wanted to have you on the, on the show, people have listened to Scott and I talk a lot that both of us come from this sort of Midwestern background, um, l- lower socioeconomic. Scott was certainly raised more middle class. You and I were raised way below the poverty line. Yeah, I think about that a lot because it it was an interesting dynamic. I think that's probably formed the worldview that you and I both have uh, because our parents chose that level of poverty rather than being forced into it. We weren't, uh, we're not generational. We don't come from generational poverty. No. And that's a very different mindset uh, and reality than what a lot of people grow up under. So 
while we had, we almost had, we had, we were surrounded by poverty and we were, we were, we came up in that area, but then, you know, in our teenage years, dad went back to working as an engineer and, you know, we sort of went straight to middle class from being very, very poor. Uh, so it, it's created a very interesting dynamic where we've seen people and interacted with people of, from all walks of life, uh, which has been uh, very interesting and fun. Yeah. Um, for those of you guys that don't know, dad was a, a Southern Baptist pastor. He was actually an engineer um, before he um, was quote unquote called what he believes called to the ministry and went into cho- basically chose a life of poverty. Dad went to a seminary when we were little bitty kids and then became a pastor and, and we were raised in parsonages which is like the house that the church owns usually behind the house or, bes- or behind the church or beside the church so we were raised in, in sort of these preacher homes in these little towns in kind of arkansas in the middle of nowhere is where we were raised outside of west memphis tennessee uh west memphis arkansas in our earliest days and then um sort of in the northwest arkansas corridor corridor up there and so one of the things, um, our, our family has been, well, they put a lot of emphasis on education. Education was important. Although you and I have talked about this a lot, our, our parents are both, um, dad was highly educated. Both of our parents are very intelligent. Um, and both of them were very hard workers. And for a long time, I thought to myself, like, m- this is why Chris and I are the way we are. We're hard workers because mom and dad were hard workers. But I don't know if that's true. And if it is, I think it was only because of the, you know, this is the, I think it was because of the genetics, not because necessarily of the way we were raised. Would you agree with that? Probably. Yeah. I think that, you know, it's always a mixture of those two things, but, um, you really get kind of a feedback loop for yourself when you work hard and see results that you want to see that drives you to work harder and sort of keep, keep going at that. And if you don't grow up in an environment where that's the case and you don't get that as much and, or if you work hard, but you don't get results that you want, then you're going to stop doing it. Yeah. Yeah. When I think back to the way we worked growing up um, and, and we both did well in school, we had talked a little bit yesterday about doing this podcast and uh, you were always a far, you worked much harder than I did growing up. Like you were always one of those guys that you had the job when you were younger. You were always saving money secretly or whatever. You always had some cash on hand, like even when you were in like the fifth grade or something, you know. And I was one of those guys that was spending all my money on baseball cards. And, you know, I was trying to skirt the, you know, if we came home and, and had gone grocery shopping, uh, it was a good time to go poop. Uh, <laughs> when it was time it was to unlock. absolutely <laughs> amazing phenomena. I was thinking about it the other day that probably 10 minutes in advance of being handed out jobs to do some type of chore, you could, you could disappear where no one could find you. And I remember mom and dad would be like, where's Matt? And eventually we sort of caught on to the trick, but we still couldn't find you. You were, yeah. you were hiding somewhere. But yeah, yeah, you were you were great at missing out on uh, chores or work to be done. Yeah, um, it gives me hope for my oldest, <laughs> my oldest daughter, who doesn't have great work ethic. That I it kind of hit me later in life. But you you were always kind of wired that way, and at least for me, and I, I think I would speak for you too. I don't know that when I when I really worked hard or when I started working hard, and again, you you have even longer experience with this than I do. I don't know that it ever had anything to do with any sort of extrinsic motivation. Like it wasn't to make mom or dad happy or proud of me. It wasn't, it was, it was entirely internal. Um, Is that your experience as well? I mean, was that, why did you get good grades in school? Why did you succeed? Why did you get a job early? Um, You were a bank teller at what, 16 or 17 years old. You were, you're just a kid handling millions of dollars in cash, which is is pretty rare if you think about it. And this wasn't a bank in like rural Arkansas. At this point, this was in Springfield, Missouri. It was like a legit nice bank. And you're a high school kid doing that kind of stuff. What what was it that drove you, you think? I think, by the way, I think they waited for my 18th birthday. I, they hired me um, so that the way it would work out on my 18th birthday, I got to start. So... I think that's a requirement for uh, federal insurance or whatever. Yeah. But I think the driver for me always um, has always been internal. 
uh, I have never cared at all what other people thought or what other people were doing. And I, I mean, that's kind of a theme overall in my life. When I look back at the last 30 years, I think most of the ways in which I was able to maybe get a little further ahead than some of my peers was driven largely by two factors. One, I, I naturally just have an internal motivation uh, to whatever it is I'm doing. And then the second one is I am naturally contrarian. I, I don't do the opposite of what other people do after I see them do it. I actually look back and realize that I've been doing the opposite of what everyone else is doing <laughs> after I figure out what they're doing. So I'm just, I'm not, um, I'm not driven by things that people, you know, the way people think you should do things. I don't typically do things that way. And, uh, I'm very, very internally motivated. Yeah. You're not though, this, the type of person that I would picture who has a problem with authority or does is you're not contrarian out of rebellion. It's not that you rebelled against the norm to do something different. You were just like, I think you would see what you believed was the best way to do things. And you just did it that way. And you didn't care if other people were doing it that way or not. That's just kind of the way you did stuff. Yep. No, yeah, I totally agree with that. There, are, I mean, there's definitely a streak, uh, in, 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 in my personality that, uh, rebels a little against authority. I particularly don't like people to tell me what to do, but it, that, that has more to do with independence than anything else. Being able to have my own path and chart my own way uh, through things. Not, not just a pure rebellion against authority or something like that. You did uh, well in high school. You always had a job in high school. You were one of those kids that graduated at the top of your class or towards the top of your class. And even your senior year, you only went to school about three hours a day and then work the rest of the day. You know, that's just another example of a place where everybody else was doing one thing and I just did something else. Not not out of spite, just because I thought, well, I've got all the credit hours I need for high school. I already am going to go to college on a, on a full-paid academic scholarship. Why would I take extra hours? So the only answer to that would be that I cared about, you know, doing the things a senior in high school typically does and when I look back, I don't have any regrets. So um, I think it was a fine choice for me. And it wouldn't be for everybody, but it was for me to start working and really get that, uh, that engine started, um, which for all practical purposes started a domino effect in my life. That, that, that job, that credit union job as a teller started the domino effect that actually got me to the point where I am today as a, as a retired 38-year-old. Yeah, let's let's actually just follow that for a minute and walk through kind of the elevator version first. We'll, I'm sure we'll get into the weeds um, both over this podcast and probably over future podcasts. But what did that progression kind of look like from you're just a, a bank teller to 20 years later, you're retired? Yeah. Well, I the summer before I became a bank teller, I blew insulation in attics. Uh, in what I think was one of the hottest summers at the time in Springfield history. And so it was a pretty miserable job. I, I learned in that time that I did not want to do that job for the rest of my life. But it was really hard work. And at the end of the day, it was done. That was an interesting feeling. You know, you get done with the end of the day and, and your day is done. No one's going to call you or text you or Slack message you or anything like that. By the way, no one would have texted you or Slack messaged you then either because... No, true. Because we didn't have cell phones. Because <laughs> it was 96 or whatever. <laughs> but but yeah, your day, your day was done and I knew what I didn't want to do. From there, I, I went to work at Walgreens for a short period of time and again, knew that I didn't want to do that. And then uh, I was fortunate enough to get a job as a teller at the credit union in Springfield. And so from there... You know, I just started working as as a teller, but it was in the era where computers were really emerging as the way that everyone was doing everything. Not that they weren't already, but they they started going on hyperspeed at that point because the internet was really taking off. And uh, so I was was lucky that uh, the president of that credit union allowed me to work on the credit union's computers when I had extra time. So I would tell her, you know, and hand out cash and that type of thing, cash checks. And then I, any downtime, which occurs, they, they, people always come in waves. 
And when no one was around, I would go work on the computers from the credit union. And so I got this, um, I got this rap for being the guy that could fix it, basically any computer. And I was real techie dork anyway, when it came to that type of thing. I uh, remember mom and dad bought us one of our first computers. We were fairly young and I think dad used it to type up sermons or something. But uh, I read the DOS manual when I was like 10 or something. And I just always was really drawn towards technology. So it was an easy thing for me to do. I enjoyed it. I liked working on you know machinery and that type of thing. From there, I got a summer internship. So hold on, back up for a second. So two things. One, mom and dad did not buy us that computer. <laughs> mom and dad never bought a computer. We were given a computer by somebody in the church that was an old 486 or whatever, or 386 maybe at the time, which is what you're at the DOS manual on. And, and two, I distinctly remember the interesting thing about when you worked at the bank was that you worked at the bank in 99 and you were there when Y2K occurred, right? Because I can remember the preparations that you did as an 18 year old kid. Everybody was sort of freaking out like, are, hey, are we going to be able to get our money after January 1 of 2000? So you were there when the millennia hit. I mean, I, I remember, I just remember all the work you put in as a kid and you would come home and talk about, yeah, we're not really sure if the computers are all going to work on January 1st. And so we've been working on that, trying to do test runs to see if they would work. And uh, so that kind of dates it. Like you were li literally, that's the start of the internet. Like the internet world was starting then. Absolutely. Yeah, that's definitely true. I remember that distinctly as well, because uh, there was some event that you guys needed to go to, the family needed to go to, and you all went to Texas to see mom's family. And I didn't get to go because I, I had to work for, for the Y2K thing. So I woke up Christmas morning uh, to myself uh, when I was 18 years old, I think, maybe 19. And I, uh, I was like, wow, this is a very surreal feeling. Luckily, my grandpa and grandma took me out to, uh, to lunch. So nice. I wasn't completely by myself. But yeah, no, that, that was the beginning of the career uh, in, that, in that world. And it was um, from there they allowed me my sophomore year of college they allowed me to go to a summer internship uh, at a place called cerner that makes medical software still makes medical software today up in the kansas city area and uh you know again i i was fortunate they picked some of the top kids from the different schools around but i only found out later that they only took one kid from each school so as a sophomore i was the only kid they picked to to do that and it was because at that time i had a very very i think i had a 40 gpa at that time um and so they thought i was smarter than i than i am uh my grade point average by the way subsequently fell as i worked worked more and uh did less focus on college uh but still graduated fairly well and the credit unions allowed me to just take a a leave of absence so when i came back i started working at the credit unions again and it was just a matter of months before the data center that ran a group of credit unions, a co-op of credit unions that included the one that I was a teller at, asked me to go uh, work with them. And so um, that was the beginning of my full-time work at, uh, in computers and software. And that was like a little incubator. That was a fascinating time because I was uh, day one, I remember being handed a piece of paper that had a list of my what I would do over the course of a day. And it was like, at 8am, you do this at 830, you do this at 10, you do this. And I looked at it. And I thought, you know, this is what computer programs do. I don't I don't need to do this. So I set out to write a computer program that would do my job. Um, I finished that just a few months later, and then didn't ever have to do that job again. And <laughs> what I did during that time frame was I worked on making the technology systems that ran the credit unions better. So I tried to harden the security, but I had a lot of time to play with things like uh, some of the emerging technologies that were occurring uh, at the time, Linux and a bunch of other things. And it was just like this little lab. It was like this little R&D lab just with me, yeah. <laughs> just with me in it. And I got to sit there and, and work and learn and do all these things. And, and I learned so much during that time frame that, you know, was essentially ready by the time uh, I graduated to do something bigger in tech. So the probably most people have figured out that you went to school for this sort of thing. You went, you got a computer information systems degree, which is kind of a programming degree. 
you were you graduated from the, Missouri State. I am the last class. Yeah, me too. Of Southwest Missouri State University. Okay. So also should show you how responsible the difference in responsibilities between Chris and I. Chris was the last graduating class from Southwest Missouri State University, and I was the first graduating class from Missouri State University, which was, so I graduated the semester after you in college. I was the first graduating class from Missouri State. It's the same college, by the way, same university, uh, but Chris is three years younger, <laughs> younger than me, so it took me seven years to get my bachelor's degree. That's where and, that competition became valuable. <laughs> you didn't yeah, want to we, see me graduate. Well, and actually, that's funny because in towards the end of your college career, we took a bunch of classes together. We started taking we started taking classes together, and would actually go to we took like we took math classes together. We took astronomy. I've talked about that astronomy class on this podcast before. We had one of the world's uh, like foremost astronomers was our professor, Doctor Wolf. We have um, is it Edward or Edwin Hubble? I don't know. It that, that does the that invented the Hubble telescope is from just outside of Springfield, and so there's a there's a huge observatory here. So there's a, a fairly good population of astronomers, and I just remember what a terrible professor he was. He was a he was there for the for the research grants, and the teaching of classes was sort of a it was a pain in his ass. He didn't want to yeah. deal with the all the 19 year old kids in astronomy class, but uh, yes, we took a handful of classes together. So you were able to leverage Cerner a little bit against the banks. It's not exactly what you meant to do, right? But Cerner offered you a job out of college. It was, that was a, at the time, a pretty high paying job for a 21 year old kid. Yeah, and if no I question about it, you went to the banks, right? And said, Hey, you, I know you guys can't offer this to me. So I guess I'm leaving and I'm moving to Kansas city. Yeah, I think I I had an inherent understanding of leverage, um, which was that the last thing that you want is to negotiate with the only negotiating partner that you could ever have, right? That's a terrible, terrible position of yep. essentially zero power. So what what I did was I, I knew that Cerner would offer me a job. My My GPA was high enough and I had the background and I could get into Cerner. I didn't want to go to Cerner. Um, because what I really wanted to do was I wanted to stay in Springfield with my wife and, uh, because otherwise she was going to have to transfer colleges and there's going to be a whole mess. Right. So quick, quick input here. What you're 21 years old, you're already married. Yes. You started dating, going out with whatever you want to call it, your wife when you were how old? 14. And, and she, she was 13. <laughs> right. Never broke up. Never broke up. Got married. That's how we do it here in the Midwest. Is uh, the I, the people in Boston have to freak out when you tell them that? Yeah, it's a, it's a huge shocker for for most of them. And, you know, we always just say like, look, I I don't even recommend that path to my children. <laughs> I don't <laughs> I don't necessarily think that's the best path for everybody. But we were again just crazy crazy fortunate that Jenny and I just work and we always have. And it's uh, not to say there's no bumps on the road. You know, there always are. I think in a in a marriage, but. We were together, you know, very, very early and have just been crazy about each other for our whole life. Yeah. So you've been together for like seven, seven years or so when you got married at the ripe old age of like 20 and 19 or 21 and 20 or whatever you guys I, were. I was 21 when we got married because I remember that we went to Hawaii to get married, which is also a total, you know, it, it was an example of the contrarian nature of what we did. We got married in Hawaii with no family anywhere near us um, because we just one thing, we just wanted it to be our own thing. Um, but second of all, you know, we were starting our, our lives together and we wanted that to all be, you know, just us. We, we, fiercely independent yep. is a good way to describe me. And, uh, and Jenny's the same way. So I remember that I was 21 because I could drink in Hawaii and she couldn't. <laughs> right. <laughs> and so that was, uh, that was a fascinating time. So she's going to school here in Springfield at uh, Missouri State or what was Southwest Missouri State. University, you get this offer from Cerner in Kansas City, and you have to go, you got to go to the banks. Yeah, I go to the credit unions and I say, look, you know, I would really like to stay here, uh, but I've got this offer from uh, from Cerner and I need to know what you guys are willing to do. And I kind of knew that they wanted me to stay as well. And uh, so they made an offer that was better than Cerner's offer. And I and I stayed. So it was a great, uh, it was a great relationship. I still know those people pretty well and, uh, stay in, stay in a little bit of contact with them here and there. I mean, not as much now that I moved to Boston, but, um, there's a lot about those days that launched my career without question, uh, because, 
uh, as as fate would have it, the president of the credit union where our our little co-op tech co-op headquarters was at was sat on the board of an insurance company and the insurance company wanted a new piece of software and we had already started uh, working on a few things for the credit union. So the credit unions came to me at one point and said, we'd like an e-statements product. And that was just an electronic way of of turning paper into PDFs. Yeah, what, what we all get now, what every single human in the whole Western world gets. Right. Remember that you used to get mailed your bank statements, and they would be sometimes 7, 10, 12 pages long. And I would imagine that for a bank, the po- the print and postage alone on sending out thousands and thousands of bank statements every month was a pretty big expense and probably took quite a bit of time. No question. And only that, you know, it was riddled with error. So sure. I mean, you know, there was there were errors all over the place. So had you started a separate business yet? Was that the first kind of project you did that was independent of what the credit unions paid you? Yeah, so that was 2004 and uh, what happened at that point is several of the credit unions wanted a website. They didn't really, they had a website, but they were those sort of junky old like uh, brochure style websites. They wanted one that allowed it in, allowed interaction and allowed you to do online banking and all that stuff. Now we didn't build the online banking system, but right off the bat, I said, okay, my circle of competence, um, which is something that I'll talk about from time to time. My circle of competence is back-end systems, servers, databases, you know, you know, deep programming languages. Artistic flair is not, not in my circle of competence. So I went to our cousin, Phil Reynolds, and I asked him at the time, I said, you know, look, would you be willing to do the front end of this website, of this uh, web application, and I'll do the back end? He said yes. And he's, he's super creative type, right? He's, Phil is... Uh really probably a musical savant. Is that fair? That, without a doubt. Absolutely. Has been in literally any instrument as well or better than almost anyone else you've ever heard at that instrument. Yes. With less time with the instrument. Yeah. That's the thing that's fascinating is how fast he picks it up. Yeah. So you go to him, but he's the creative type. He's for sure the way more artsy. He's extremely good. He's always been a good artist too. Like he was always good at drawing. I remember and you know, his, his degree is in electronic art. So he, he had the ability to do, you know, beautiful graphic, uh, mock-ups on the computer, which I thought, you know, would be super helpful. And it, and it clearly was. So we, we got together, we wrote that e-statements program in a month. It didn't take us any time at all. And we did it. Um, I remember very clearly I was taking 20 credit hours, 21 credit hours that particular semester. And I was, I was working about 30 hours a week. And then at night, uh, through to two, three in the morning, we would work on the credit union stuff. So it was just, you know, from the time I woke up in the morning, super early until crazy late at night and get four or five hours of sleep maybe, and just keep cranking on it. So we delivered that e-statements product and then they, uh, the credit unions introduced us to a, a uh, guy that ran a, a, an insurance company. And that was the first time that Phil and I had ever um, had ever interacted with insurance at that level. And so we had to learn how insurance worked while simultaneously programming how to rate insurance for uh, insurance agents. And that was obviously insanely complex. So we had to soak up all this information and then, you know, programs don't do well with uh, ambiguities. And so you have to know exactly what the program is supposed to do. So we built this uh, quoting system that we sold to that first company in Nixa, Missouri. And that same system spread across the United States very quickly. Yeah. So he, this guy comes to you, um, Art, right? Art? No, this was actually oh. a guy named Keith Rawlings oh, okay. from Nixa, Keith. Nixa Farmers Mutual. Comes to you and says, can you, do you think you can write quote software for us? Is yeah. that fair? Is that yeah. that's basically what he said? So you went from doing, you were doing bank statements and you had done a little, some sort of updated higher security websites for the credit unions to to make sure. I remember you were, you, you would try to test those websites to make sure it was difficult for hackers to, to get in or that they couldn't get in. You really completely changed the trajectory of the business when he came to you and said, can you write this? And this was literally, I this was like the, 
the mathematical algorithms and all those sorts of things, right? For like, hey, this is the demographic for what kind of software or what kind of insurance was it? You remember what? This was is it? all property casualty insurance. So okay. this is basically home, the way to, for, for most people to think of it is just homeowner's insurance. Okay. And so you put in like, okay, here's the, here's, I assume like, here's the location of the house. Here's the cost of the house. Here's the, what, whatever all of those sort of inputs are. And you wrote the quote software and said, okay. And that would tell the insurance company what the right premium was to charge, like what the right, the bet, right? The over under on whether, how often you would see a claim on those sort of houses. Yeah. I mean, yeah. And you, you, you essentially, yeah, they have to file their rate. So the, the rate for the, for the software was known, but the overall mathematics behind it are, are fairly complicated. There's a lot of moving variables that you're putting together in order to, you know, spit out a, a premium. And remember we're, we're crazy young. I'm 20, I think I'm 21, 22. Yeah. Uh, when we started doing this and, um, for it to start spreading like it did was was really impressive what we saw as we went out on the road and did we did a lot of different um trade shows and those types of events we noticed that the companies that were selling the systems that ran the the insurance companies were very old and antiquated and so right off the bat there was this spark for phil and i both that hey we can probably disrupt that um, if we could get the funding, we could probably disrupt it. So we were, uh, you know, paying ourselves basically nothing and living off our, our wives, uh, salaries and whatnot. And, uh, we had a guy come to us to actually two, two of our current customers came to us and said, uh, Hey, we want to, find out if you guys are willing to write an actual software system that goes, you know, end to end and runs the company. And this is web software, right? So the one thing to remember is today, everything is web software. I mean, right. you're shocked if you have to download software onto your computer, if you even have a computer, most people are just, you know, cell phones and, and uh, iPads, iPads and, and that yeah, kind of sure. thing. But in those days, all business software was downloadable software or software that came on a CD or sure. Remember, you'd go to Best Buy or Walmart and you would go buy Microsoft Office or the or the new OS from Microsoft or or whatever, right? You would have to go buy it. You put the CD or DVD in the computer. You'd load the thing and and it may take four of them or five of them. Sure, you, know, you had to like pop in the next disc, that kind of thing. So. But they wanted they wanted it from the beginning all in the cloud. That was part of the ask, or you decided like this is the direction yes, we're going to go. Yes, but the the word cloud was not was yet not invented right, either. Sure. So okay. what they wanted was they just they knew how smooth the process had gone. Remember, these were quoting system clients of ours. So we had done sort of the point of sale quoting system side. Now we were expanding that to encompass the entire business that they did, and so we built that software for them. They basically, uh, the guy's name was Art Meadows from Panhandle Farmers Mutual and Dan DeArmond from Friends Cove Mutual in Pennsylvania. One's in West Virginia, the other's in, P in Pennsylvania. And they were already quoting system customers, customers of ours. And that went very, very well. It was, it was very successful uh, in its launch for both of those companies. So they had a large amount of trust for us. They went to three or four additional insurance companies. And together, they all decided to put some money in a pool there was no equity at the time. Uh, there was no equity ask. They just wanted the software and they trusted that we would build it because we, we built successful software for them in the past. So in 2008, we negotiated those contracts. Uh, and then in 2000, January 1st of 2009, we started coding, um, on the, on the software and we delivered the first one in July of 2010, so uh, about 18 months. Yep. And then turned a new company live essentially, uh, you know, every couple months or every month thereafter. And, uh, that just kept going. So Brightcore was the name of that, that product suite. And it, it, it exploded very, very quickly. I mean, the, the need in the marketplace was obvious and, uh, and it, it worked out quite well. Yeah. It was, a uh, the implementation of that software for each new insurance company is a, is a pretty in-depth process, right? It's a, it's a SaaS company. So it's, you've got the software as service, you've got to go in and it literally runs the software companies kind of from start to finish, like you said, from, from front to back. 
And so one of the things that I remember you saying was that, you know, there everybody knows about sort of the big seven or whatever, whatever they are, the giant insurance companies, these, these, you know, the, the, the state farm and the all states and the Geico's and progressives and stuff. But there was this in massive sort of mid-level and smaller level market that there just wasn't anything out there for, for those people who were doing premiums, what, like they were doing a million to 10 million in premiums a year, somewhere in that ballpark. Pretty close. Yep. And and that's exactly right. I mean, these are basically companies that had been ignored by the technology industry for quite some time. Most of the players that were there were not really there purposefully. They were overgrown reinsurance companies, which are companies that sell insurance to insurance companies. We won't get into that. Uh, But essentially, we were the first company to come in and just light a fire under new tech for these small insurance companies. And as we got better at it, the companies got bigger and bigger. Uh, and we were able to slowly start moving up market towards larger and larger companies. And today we've, we've talked with many companies that are companies that uh, everybody knows about. Yep. Super interesting. So how many employees or software engineers did you have to hire for that initial 18 month period to get Brightcore out the door? You know, I'm thinking the number was pretty close to 30, okay. something like that. It's probably about 30 people total. And is that when you got the office downtown on Olive Street? Is that, yep. so you got the office, now you got, because I remember you were in this little that little Spanish building for a while, right? And it was just like a little bitty, um, like a very small office inside a big building. And then all of a sudden you took over this pretty good location downtown and, and just continued to grow. Turn that thing out in 18 months, you said July of 10? Is that what you said? July, July of 10. Of, July right. of 10. And it just kept taking off from there. And so from there, that's been your that's been your primary product for the past decade, right? Correct. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, just uh, constantly growing and changing and evolving the product and, uh, you know, growing the company. I mean, obviously, from 30 people to 300 people is a pretty massive uh, change. And there were ups and downs. Oh, my God, there were ups and downs. There were you know, times we had to lay people off and there were times when I would lay awake at night sweating, you know, cold sweats, terrified that uh, we weren't going to be able to make payroll. And we always worked it out. We always got there even, you know, by just sheer willpower, grinding out the last little bit to get uh, to make sure we could make payroll. And then, you know, there would be uh, past that some really, really great times where the company just continued to accelerate. So, it's been uh, a, a, an enormous journey and a lot of fun and sort of culminated in the last last year and the year before. We did two different deals with private equity partners. The last one, uh, I, I did a, a good portion of it um, and uh, did that work to essentially bring in more capital to the company. And uh, that added some uh, a little bit of liquidity for me, enough liquidity for me that I could retire yeah. while still being on the board of directors and still owning uh, a pretty good portion of the company as well. So today, you know, my my uh, status is that I'm the, the chairman of the board, but I don't work for the company anymore. I'm no longer in executive management and uh, spend all my time in, in my days reading and, and studying investments and uh, spending time with my kids and my wife and that's what I do. What was your official role uh, before you retired in October? What was your title? It was really the COO. I, I did chief operating officer at that point. You know, my my world was tech, but in a tech company, the COO is probably doing quite a bit of overarching tech thinking, but sure. also trying to make sure that the business is running properly. Um, in in all actuality, Phil and I sort of ping ponged the role of of CEO. Um, it was his title. And uh, I always did my best to defer to him whenever there was something going on. Somebody has to be the boss. Sure. Um, and so I was okay with uh, you know Phil doing that role. And he did a great job doing it. Still does a great job doing it. But you know, by the time that I had the ability to retire, going on you know, 20 straight years of working nonstop, I was ready for it. <laughs> sure. I didn't realize how ready I was for it until uh, it had settled in for a couple months. And then it, I was like, wow, this is amazing. I, I remember, well, for, first off, it's, it's insane to think about. And one of the reasons that it's important for me to have you on this, on the show 
and to talk to you even after today about this is that, um, you know, I, I really think it's rare, really rare for, for the true American dream, what people consider the American dream to occur today, where, where grandma and grandpa didn't give you any money because grandma and grandpa didn't have any money. Mom and dad didn't give you any money. You didn't fall ass backwards into something. Um, there's always in business, there's always a part of it that's, that's luck. Like there's some lucky things that occur, but ultimately you and you and Phil really built this on your back. Just, just, you know, just bootstrapped it for the very beginning. And, and you went from being two guys that worked in your apartment or Phil's house, Phil's first house to this little office on cherry street to, sorry, damn it. <laughs> sorry, dude. Uh, to an office with 30 employees to a, um, you know, to, which is a business. You, you had this nice little business with 30 employees in Springfield, Missouri, where everybody's in Springfield to now a, a pretty massive S corporation, which has offices in Springfield, in what, in Boston, in London, in Kosovo, in, right? Am I, what else? I mean, you've yeah, got employees got, I mean, everywhere. We have, uh, you know, we have groups of people in Mexico City, Brazil. Um, Kosovo is is a big spot for us, and then, you know, sprinkled all throughout Europe, South America, Central America, all over North America. Uh, we have some in West Africa. Uh, so we've it's got wild. people sort of spread out everywhere at this point. Um, you know, it's a fascinating thing. I, I think about it too. The 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 spot where ultimately we we have landed thus far, and you know, there's still a lot more to that story, but the spot that we've landed thus far is such a great picture of what can be done. But also, you know, you have to also. I, I'm very sensitive to the reality that I had a lot of help along the way as well. You, there's an element of this that is pull yourself up by your own bootstraps and work your butt off, and that's true, yep. right? I don't deny that in, at all. But I went to college on a full paid scholarship from Missouri, right? Yeah. So it's not like the it's not like um, it was entirely on my own. There was a lot of help along the way from various uh, organizations and a lot of things that that helped us to get where we are. So it's a great example. I know you and I have talked a lot about this, but you know, luck tends to favor those who swing an awful lot at all the pitches that come in, yeah, you know, you're swinging for the fences, swing for the fences every time. And you might get a hold of one at, you know, every so often. And so the combination of those two things has been sort of the outcome, you know, that I've, I've come to today. Yeah, certainly, you know, you didn't, you didn't earn your IQ. You didn't earn your, your family. And while, while our parents weren't able to <laughs> buy us, uh, happy meals from McDonald's, um, they certainly were very supportive in our, in our education, efforts. And, um, you know, we had a great home. Mom and dad loved each other and loved us. And we had a home that was conducive for learning, which was, which was really cool. And it really started the process for you of being a lifelong learner. And, um, I remember when you texted me, um, that morning that you retired, <laughs> you sent me a text and it said dot, 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 and I'm retired. And I didn't know it was coming. And so at first I was like, oh no, like what's, you know, the, the way a lot of this happens is when you have a big like tech startup company is, is you've kind of made it when the VC firms remove you as a, as an, ex as an executive and force you in her. So I, my first thought was, oh God, he got fired and he's, and he's retired. Cause he, I mean, he's fine. And he got a severance package. You're like, no, it's just, I, he, nope, everything's fine. I just, it's, it's, you know, it's, I'm. You had run the rat race harder than anybody I've ever met. And there have been other people that have run it as hard as you, but I don't know them for 20 years. And, um, you know, you you have never done the eight to five job, leave work at home out after after blowing insulation in a roof in an attic, in an attic. That's the last time you did it at 17 years old. And after that, you never did it again. And so, um, you know, you there's a there's a gamble there. That's uh, certainly it's an educated risk where you kind of push all your chips to the middle of the table for the last two decades. And the payoff is if it goes well, you're 37 years old, you live in Boston, you're retired. You get to spend time with your family, spend time with your kids. You have three kids, 10 and under, um, you, you know, and, uh, and then I, I went out and visited you this fall, just a couple weeks into your retirement, stayed at your house for a few days and, and you 
still wake up early every morning like you always have, and you make some coffee, and you sit down and you read a book, start reading a book. And then like it, you know, it's it's been fascinating. I I didn't know there's no way to know after 20 years of working, you know, sun up sundown like nonstop. You don't really know what it's going to be like when you don't have to do it. What has been fascinating to me is that you know, you and I have talked before about I don't remember the last time that I was bored. Yeah. I still don't remember the last time I was bored. Right. I haven't been bored a day that I've been retired. And part of that is because I I follow a very similar routine. Like I said, I wake up early in the morning. I couldn't not wake up early in the morning. My, my eyes just pop open. This is the way it is. You do it too. Yep. I think we got that from mom. Yep. But, uh, you know, I, I make coffee and I try to get through about 500 pages of, of a book a day of multiple books uh, a day. Now, I don't always get it done. Uh, there are some days where there are other things to do, but um, I've never stopped being massively fascinated by basically everything. And so I'm just insatiably curious. Yeah. And I read and read and read and read and read. And I would be perfectly happy if for the rest of my life, all I did was read and then as long as I have an outlet to share what I've read to some people, and this is sort of the, the, the weird paradox that I, I get into fame is hell for me. And yet I need an outlet to share things because I love to teach. Yep. Teaching is my, is my favorite thing to do outside of learning, which is my number one favorite thing to do. Right. So, um, one thing that I'm still, uh, you know, trying to find the right outlet for is here. I'm consuming an enormous amount of information on a regular basis and learning an awful lot. And uh, still trying to find a good way to teach some of that and, and, and make sure that other people get some of the benefit uh, who don't have time, don't have the advantage of time to sit down and read 500 pages a day. Um, so that's still an element I'm working on. Yeah. And one of the, certainly, hopefully, we're able to do that some um, on the podcast moving forward. Uh, you and I are, are very similar in a lot of ways and very different in a lot of ways. One of the things for us that I think has always come naturally is it's easy to teach via spoken word for us. We've both written a lot, and but writing doesn't come naturally for me, and I don't think it does you either. It just takes a long time, right? And so I can say in a one-hour podcast, in exactly one hour of recording, what would take me 10 days of writing to put out, um, and so it's easier for me to record the podcast. And for some people... I've got a great editor in chief, uh, Nick Solin. He's just this incredible writer, super quiet guy. Doesn't speak very much. One of those guys that when he talks, everybody shuts up and listens because he has something real important to say. And uh, but he is such an excellent writer that he just writes all day, every day. And he, you know, it appears that he really enjoys that. He's he's wanted. He's sort of worked his whole life in order to get the job where he gets to write. And for for me, I would rather do it this way. It's more efficient. Yeah, I, I would too. I I actually. Um told my oldest son Carter that I wanted, he, he was having trouble in school writing enough. So in a writing exercise, he might only write two or three sentences. It's like, well, I've captured everything. And I, I told him just stop writing and imagine that you're talking because that kid can talk and yeah. talk and talk and talk. He inherited that Reynolds trait. Yeah. Um, and so I said, just imagine you're talking, but then type the words rather than have them come out of your mouth. Right. And uh, immediately he started writing more right. because he thought about it as talking instead. I think you and I both process information better uh, or at least dispense information better uh, when we speak it. What? Well, I, I process it better too. Yeah. The part, I, there's, most people uh, who are that way are learning while they're talking. Absolutely. Sometimes they talk in order to learn. So Yeah, there are times when I don't know if you and Jenny ever do this, but you know, like Rachel... Rachel certainly cares about the business, but she doesn't really care about the business, like not the details of the business. And so there's lots of times when I'm, I say, hey, can I, can I share this thing that's going on, which is, and she understands now, I'm not asking for her opinion or her feedback on it. I just need an audience to talk through it to. And that's easier to do with an actual human in the room than just to the wall, though sometimes I do it to the wall too, or especially if I'm driving in the car. I'll just sort of have conversations with myself to talk through the thing, and it's extremely helpful because I get to process it verbally, the things that I've the, the things that I've learned. So um, I'm jealous. I'm jealous of your uh, retirement. Not that I don't. Um, for for those of you listening out here who are Barbologic clients or Barbologic staff, 
I love my job. It's the best job I've ever had in my life. I love it. it. Has nothing to do with the work. I'm like you. I don't think that I would ever be able to retire and go play golf. That's never going to happen. That's just not who I am because I'm a lifelong learner. I'm jealous of the peace. Like you live a life now of there's no drama. There's no like you don't have to worry about making payroll or or you know doing just dealing with the drama, dealing with the drama, running a business on a daily basis, and uh, and the rat race right that there's always. Like the work is never done. You talked about the advantage of the best thing about blowing insulation in a in an attic is that at the end of the day, the attic's full of insulation and that job is done. Um, there was a, a cup. There were a couple summers when I was a teacher that I helped renovate your house that you and and Jenny, I think it was your first house that you guys put for sale. And that was a very um, satisfying job, even though it was complete manual labor for me. But for the same reason, like you would go work on a room and renovate a room, and at the end of the renovation project, maybe it was a day, maybe it was two weeks or whatever, it was done, and that part was done, and you kind of check it off the list, and then did the same thing for Phil. I think the following year. Um, and, and owning a business there, it, that's never there. You just decide at the end of the day when you're going to stop working. Some days you decide like at one o'clock in the afternoon, you're like, okay, that's, I'm not, you know, and then a lot of times it's one o'clock in the morning and you've worked and you you just, and when you wake up, there's more work to do. So there's never, there's no way to just leave work at work. Uh, and then for both of us, the last several years, 100% of our work outside of, of traveling for business has occurred in our home. So when all of the work is also in your home, it's hard to leave work at work and not take it home because it's at home. Yeah, I think that's probably a, a, a problem that almost all knowledge workers deal with today because most of the knowledge workers that I know of that you know spend a lot of their time in front of a computer or whatever, uh, they, their work allows them to work from home some number of days a week or something. That's a very fairly common uh, setup. And even if not, you know, your email is probably always accessible to you or something like Slack or Microsoft Teams or something like that on your phone attached to your, you know, attached to your body all day, every day. And I think there's a whole th really important thing there, which is learning how to ignore so that you can actually create a little space in your head to to actually recuperate. Um and I, I understand that all the better now that I've had several months now where I've been completely, you know, outside of the rat race. And uh, it's just, it's energizing to a degree that I did not expect. And uh, it has changed a lot about my interaction. I mean, you're talking so many years at this point between my wife and I, and of course, with my kids now, my oldest is, is uh, nine uh, and nine and a half, I guess, almost 10. And, uh, my interaction with my kids, because I'm not preoccupied with work. Sure. You know, I can put a book down fairly easily and, and interact with them when the school day's done. Whereas before, even if I was physically present, I wasn't mentally present yep. with them. And that has been a massive change yep. that, uh, I've been very fortunate to be able to, to, uh, be a part of. And my wife, likes to tell me when I'm slipping into old ways. Cause I, I can have a tendency, like for example, when three kids are with each other and our kids are very close in age or two years apart when they're together, things get loud and a little bit chaotic. Yeah. And it's pretty easy for me to sort of sneak off at that point, grab a book and get some coffee and start reading. And my wife will come down and say, Chris, yeah. you're doing it again. <laughs> right. go, oh, oh. <laughs> right. And then you realize it wasn't always just work. Sometimes work is also an excuse. And so, uh, sure. you know, that's been a, a, an interesting facet of this, this new era of my life. Well, it's, it's interesting to put a capstone on this, that because you ran that rat race well, and it was, it was a rat race, it was very difficult and high stress, and you now have the freedom to be able to spend that kind of time and be present with your kids who are all under 10, most of the world works in an eight to five job that they can leave at work and they are able to potentially be present. That's not to say there isn't stressors in an eight to five type job. There certainly are, but it's easier to leave that at work and be present at home um, in the evenings, but you're probably not going to get to spend all day every day with your kids at 37, right? 
So that's that's the deal. And so that's the gamble. And and I also want to be clear, I think we'll probably talk about this in a future principles episode that I think that for those who can handle it, that the highest calling from a occupation standpoint, uh, certainly certainly in the United States, having only lived here, um, is to own your own business. I think that's a I I think that's wonderful. Um, I also don't think that there's anything wrong with people who just want to do the safe thing and work 40 hours a week, Monday through Friday, and sort of live for the weekends and watch the football games and have drink the beer and eat the steak and go through the football around with your kid on a Saturday. That's There are days, certainly there are many days, that I'm very jealous of those people who are able to do that. Um, but those guys and ladies don't ever get to, they don't get to retire at 37. Um, or uh, and, and then, you know, the risk is there too when you own your own business that the 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 greatest end to that is really what you've been able to do, which is build up a big business, retire young, spend time with your family, uh, be financially independent. And, and, but the, the gamble, the risk is there were many times for you and, and there've been times for me and times for almost every business owner that you might lose everything. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, my house was, um, perpetually on the lean of the business up until really just like four years ago, maybe yeah. something like that. So, uh, if things really went all the way under, I lost my house right. and my cars and everything that I owned. And, um, you know, I think my family came to peace with that, that it was okay, but that's the pressure that's in your head. That's why you, as a business owner, you can't let things go. Uh, you keep ruminating about what are the possibilities? How do I solve this problem? Yep. How do I get these things taken care of? It's because one, there's a giant pile of people that depend on you. Uh, all the employees that are there that you feel like it's important, obviously, that you you do your best by them. But then also you are massively on the hook for yep. it. And, you know, I think the day that that was no longer the case was a pretty uh, fantastic day for me. Uh, so, yeah, it's been it's been great. It's a great thing. And, and I agree with you, too, that it's a very high calling to be able to uh, own a business and build it employ people and, and create something in the world. Uh, it's also really great when you can get out. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Hey, thank you for being on the show uh, today. We'll have you on more for sure. I'm excited to continue to talk about really get into so that we're able to tell your story today. And in future episodes, uh, we're going to talk a lot about our just sort of life principles will be short episodes is kind of our, our goal here is a short 15 minute long episodes where we talk about little principles, life principles that have worked uh, for us or that we believe in for whatever reason. Uh, principles that have worked in our business, um, both yours and mine. And again, those aren't the same. And I, I love the fact that we're sort of coming from, as brothers, we, we've got a lot of similarities, but we've got tremendous amounts of difference as well that we can bring um, different voices to the, uh, to, the, to the conversation. So thanks for being on the show. Uh, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. We will uh, talk again soon. Thank you all for listening, and we'll see you in a couple days. Ba 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 